Good afternoon and, and welcome to today's disputation. My name is Rick Barry and I'm assistant professor of theology. This is the fourth disputation that has been hosted by Disputatio, which is an initiative of the humanities program. This event has two simultaneous purposes. First, to introduce you to the great Dominican tradition of disputation and to suggest ways that this approach remains important for the modern world. Second, we will have the opportunity to participate in a disp disputation with our two guests, Elizabeth Nolan Brown and Luis Perry. Before introducing our speakers, a little more about what we'll be doing today, and, and just so you know, these remarks are about four or five minutes. One of the fascinating things about Providence College is that our mission statement explicitly says that we at PC encourage a pedagogy of disputed questions. And this raises the obvious question, what is a disputed question and why is it so important at PC? The practice of disputation has been a hallmark of Dominican education since the early 13th century, which is to say since the time of St. Dominic himself. In fact, the entire educational formation of the early Dominicans was centered on the rhythm of lectures and classroom disputations. Each week, students would learn from a teacher the key principles of a field of thought through lectures, and then engage in lively, playful disputations where students would go back and forth, raising challenging objections to the ideas being presented and responding to those objections through the best arguments they could muster. There was a game-like quality to this education. While the top topics were often serious, they were engaged in a competitive forum where each person assisted the other to think more deeply by presenting the best opposing arguments that they could. Disputation is a form of intellectual hospitality, as our mission book says. This, met this method is a mode of pursuing truth that seeks out the strongest arguments from all interlocutors. It is not afraid to hear the objections of the com conversation partner. In fact, it is confident that by squarely facing and responding to objections, our knowledge of the truth and our love of the truth can be straight strengthened. Truth, after all, has nothing to fear from challenging questions. And once again, to quote the Providence College Mission book, the method of disputed questions carries forward the premise that truth-seeking is a common pursuit. Through it, we all draw closer to veritas. So, how do disputations work? The disputation was provided over by a professor who announced beforehand the question that would be asked. One student designated the opponent, supplied arguments against the thesis, while the other, the respondent, attempted to answer the objections that were raised and demonstrate their weaknesses. In the medieval period, after the students went back and forth with objections and responses, the exercise would culminate in a determination, at which point the professor would give his or her mature assessment of the question, drawing on the strongest points articulated by each side. As you know, the motto of Providence College is Veritas, truth, and it has been a conviction of the Dominican order from its foundation that the method of disputation is one of the most powerful tools we have in the pursuit of truth. In fact, steadfast and joyful commitment to this method may be more necessary today than ever that's why the Disputatio project exists, and that's why we're hosting this event today. One final note. It is important to say at the outset that as we come together at this table, we come together not so much as opponents, but on partner, as partners on the way to truth. By presenting their best arguments on either side of the question, our speakers today will help us all to think deeply and rigorously about this crucial question a question that each of us faces in different ways. How has the sexual revolution changed the world and how should we respond to it? With all that in mind, I am thrilled to introduce our two speakers. Louise Perry, on my left, is a journalist and author based in London. She is a co-founder of the feminist think tank, The Other Half, which promotes policies that advance the interests of women and families and which grows out of her work as a campaigner against sexual violence. She recently published her provocative book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, 
A New Guide to Sex in the 21st Century. And one reviewer called this book an unusually lucid commentary on sex in the 21st century, which is daring and important. Joining her today on my right is Elizabeth Nolan Brown. Ms. Brown is a journalist and senior editor at Reason Magazine, co-founder of the libertarian feminist group Feminists for Liberty, an or organization that identifies itself as being anti-sexism and anti-state, pro-markets and pro-choice in everything. It says we are classically liberal, anti-carceral, and sex positive. Ms. Brown has written widely on issues relating to free speech, technology, and sex policy, including especially, deba especially debates related to sex work. Thank you both for joining us. The question I have asked for today is as follows, and I've put it on the screen. After more than 50 years, should we conclude that the sexual revolution has failed and that it has made life worse for most women? and men. Ms. Perry will take the yay position to this question, and Ms. Brown will take the nay position. On the screen, you can see the time limits that we've set for each round. Throughout the debate, please prepare questions to ask the speakers. And there is an online form that you can use to submit those questions. And as you hopefully see at your seat, a QR code uh, with palm cards where you can submit the questions and, and they'll also be a QR code at the screen, on the screen at the end if, if you don't have one near you. I now invite Elizabeth Nolan Brown to, to, to present her opening statement. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here for this debate today. Um, I think it's probably important to start by talking about what we mean by the sexual revolution. Um, I've got you know uh, some, some points here that are by no means exhaustive, but when I, when I think of the sexual, sexual revolution, I think uh, it means you know, a loosening of conservative social mores around sex, reproduction, relationships, and sexuality, a societal refutation of the idea that sex outside of marriage is inherently immoral, a recognition that women, all women, regardless of marital status, race, class, the way they dress, the places they frequented, had a right to agency and autonomy in their reproductive lives and their sex lives, to say yes or no to sexual activity, to set their own boundaries. A recognition that women have desire too, that they can experience sexual pleasure and deserve to experience sexual pleasure. A decoupling of sex from reproduction, a loosening of laws restricting sexuality, destigmatization of talking about sex and a subsequent loosening of some cultural constraints on discussing or depicting sex in media, entertainment, education, etc. Growing acceptance of different ways of expressing sexuality, organized pushback against sexual violence and sexual harassment, increasing emphasis on consent in sexual encounters, and eventually a refutation of the idea that homosexuality is inherently immoral and a recognition of the dignity and rights of same-sex couples and same-sex attraction. It's refreshing to see in, in, in Louise's book that she doesn't outright reject all of this. In her book, she applauds the availability of, availability of contraception, for instance, and the tolerance of same-sex relationships. But I think she's selective of what the sexual and what she says the sexual revolution means, so that everything potentially objectionable about modern sexual culture, for instance, some women feeling pressured into casual sex, men like Harvey Weinstein preying on women, BDSM proclivities foisted on unsuspected partners, these are all the fault of the sexual revolution, but all the good things about today's attitudes towards sex and relationships aren't. I don't think we can look at it like that, and we can so easily you know, separate the part of the sexual revolution of which one approves from the parts which might be less desirable. Giving people more autonomy over their sex lives and romantic relationships, destigmatizing birth control and condoms, taking rape and sexual assault more seriously, these are all part and parcel with things like the sex worker rights movement, hookups outside relationships, increasing experimentation with different types of sex. If you give people more sexual freedom and more permission to talk about sex, sometimes they'll use this freedom in ways you might not personally choose. I also think that Louise's book tends to downplay the positives about today's sexual culture while whitewashing sexual and romantic relations in eras past. For instance, Harvey Weinstein and the Me Too movement are examples that she uses in her book to say that the sexual revolution has gone wrong. But no one, or at least very few people, are condoning what Weinstein and predators like him did. 
And the very fact that we've been talking about all this stuff, about sexual harassment, power differentials, what differentials, what meaningful consent looks like, is because of the sexual revolution. It is because our culture now takes women's agency seriously. It is because talking about sex, good, bad, wanted, unwanted, has become destigmatized and permissible in polite society. It is because we no longer accept the idea that things like this must be kept quiet lest we damage the reputations of good men or upset delicate sensibilities. It is because the sexual revolution meant not just an awakening to the fact that women can be, sex women can be sexual and should be able to say yes on their own terms without being penalized, but also that they have a right to say no. In the bedroom, sure, but also in the workplace, on the internet, everywhere. The sexual revolution didn't create Me Too monsters, it made outing them possible. This part of the sexual revolution has been a long time coming, of course, but it started in work that feminists were doing in the 1960s and 70s, when they pushed the idea that we might take seriously both sexual pleasure and sexual harassment and violence. They did this because the pre-revolution era was far from idyllic and many people for many people who it came when it came to relationships. Certainly, many people felt hurt by romantic relationships, dating, et cetera, back then, even if, if there wasn't as much sex perhaps happening. Um, we get, you know, in the current, in the case against the sexual revolution, we get a lot of statistics about people wanting relationships but it not being reciprocated. But this is definitely not new. The book implies that a lot of problematic things about dating and sex are unique to our times. But one need only look at literature or films from earlier eras to read memoirs from that time period or talk to anyone who was young then to recognize that all was not well. Men absolutely still pressured women into sexual activity they didn't want, sometimes using force when persuasion or coercion didn't work. Girls and women absolutely felt pressured to go all the way so that boys and men would like them. Only back then, the consequences could be much more dire. People were much more likely to be socially ostracized if word of their sexual activity got out. They were much more likely to be, less likely to be supported or believed if they were victimized. They were much less able to prevent unwanted pregnancy and often rushed into marriage they maybe didn't want if that did happen. People back then were locked up for breaking laws or expectations that said female promiscuity was a form of deviance and mental illness. There was a complete lack of concern when violence was committed against sex workers or others deemed the wrong kind of women. Wives couldn't be legally raped because it was thought that rape could not happen within the context of a marriage. Wives were also expected to look the other way if their husbands cheated because, you know, men and women just had different sexual needs. Women were expected to ignore unwanted advances in the workplace and objectification at work because boys will be boys and, you know, that's how men are. This was not an era of bliss between the sexes by any means. It was one in which women were expected to keep quiet about what they wanted and what they didn't want and men were allowed to get away with all manners of bad behavior. Now, I'm sure Louise will argue, as she does in her book, that men still get away with all sorts of bad behavior and that women are still often quiet about it, or that many women don't feel empowered to fully embrace what they want. And that's all true. But it's also true that we've made great strides. The fact that we've still got further to go is not evidence that the sexual revolution failed so much as that we still have more work to do. It's become popular today to say that we must move beyond consent. That just because an encounter was consented to does not mean that it's good. And sure, we should have more conversations on college campuses, in the culture at large, in our own relationships about what good sex means for men, for women, for all sorts of different individuals. About how sex can go wrong and hurt people even when all parties consent. But let's remember that we are building on a concept, consent, popularized by proponents of the sexual revolution. Let's remember that the whole reason we can talk openly about this stuff is because of the sexual revolution. And let's remember that we are talking about individuals, and individuals don't neatly fall into sexual categories. There is no universal good sex for women or any gender. The only way to know what good sex looks like for your partner is through open communication. And open communication about sex is another tenet of the sexual revolution. For instance, if you don't personally like what sex gets a little kinky ever, good for you, many people don't. It's fine to make this clear up front or to say no should the issue come up during a sexual counter and definitely to steer clear of anyone who won't accept your boundaries. It's fine to say we need better ways to empower people and especially young women to feel comfortable both exploring and setting these boundaries. It's fine to say we need more conversation about what folks might be seeing in porn and how it's not okay to just say spring spanking or slapping on an unsuspecting partner. 
But it's not fine to say that no one should be allowed to like these activities or to depict these activities. Very many healthy, empowered people in loving and respectful relationships do, and this includes many women. To say that women can't actually enjoy certain types of sex just because they're outside of the mainstream or outside of what you might personally want is to infantilize women and deny them the very same sexual agency that makes setting boundaries and pushing back against bad sexual behavior possible. I could say a lot about this. I think there's a lot of uh, misrepresentation about BDSM in her book and just like there's a lot of misrepresentation about, about sex work and liberalism more generally, but I'll save that for later if it comes up during the questions. For now, I just wanna make two quick points on that front. The first is that banning activities like sex work doesn't make them go away. It just think, makes things less safe for everyone involved. If you think all women in sex work are victims, and I do not, but this is an argument many people make against it, then this should especially concern you. Under a criminalized system, sex workers are less able to engage in practices that protect them from exploitation and violence, and less able to report crimes against them when they do occur. There's a ton of research showing this. For instance, one recent study of 31 European countries found that liberalizing prostitution laws leads to significant decrease in rape rates, while prohibiting it leads to a significant increase. This is why sex work decriminalization is supported by the World Health Organization, groups fighting AIDS, and all sorts of groups concerned with public health, women's rights, and sexual violence, as well as sex workers themselves from all walks of life around the world. The second thing is that increasing shame and stigma, stigma around normal sexual desire can backfire. For instance, there's research suggesting that it's not the amount of porn viewing that predicts whether someone will say it's causing problems in their life or relationships, but whether they feel shame about this viewing in the first place. And we've seen all sorts of tragic examples about how people trying to suppress sexual desire or expression can go horribly wrong, such as the Atlantic massage parlor shooter who, alleged, um, who massacred a bunch of people because he felt like women at these parlors were tempting him to pay for sex. This is obviously an extreme example, but it highlights one end of this. On, on a more common end, research has shown that during hookups, most people uh, have overwhelmingly positive views of them during the hookup or say that they felt overwhelmingly positive. But after, there's more regret and disappointment, suggesting that it might not be sex per se causing the feeling, bad feelings, but guilt surrounding sex. To close, I would just like to throw out a few metrics about today's sexual culture that go against the idea that we're living in some sort of depraved libertine hellscape where everyone is just running around having casual sex all the time and not caring about relationships at all. Yes, the sexual revolution has made it possible to have fulfilling relationships outside of marriage, but people are still getting married in massive numbers and divorce rates are actually down. We have the lowest rate of divorce, marriages that end in divorce in 50 years. Perhaps people figuring out who they are as sexual beings before they marry and not feeling pressure to marry just so that they can have sex or avoid reputational damage or whatever is a good thing. Sexual violence is also way down. In the National Crime Victims Survey from 1973, there were an estimated 105,000 rapes of young women. By 2005, even though there was much more women in this age group and much more reporting of rape, this number had gone from 100, more than 100,000 down to 30,000. A DOJ report found that the rape rate in 2021 was 1.2 per 1,000 women, down from 3.6 in 1995. And all of this has um, coincided with increasing attention to condemnation of all sorts of things that aren't necessarily criminal, criminal, but are arguably, or in some cases, definitely bad. There's much, much less support for people dating those with whom they have some sort of control over in the workplace. There's much more condemnation of people sexualizing teenagers or dating people much younger than themselves. Unintended pregnancies are, among young people are down. Teen pregnancies are way down. We've seen the rate, rate drop from down 72% since the 1990s. Uh, among the youngest teenage girls, age 15 and 16, there were 44 births per 1,000 girls in 1960. Today there are six. The abortion rate peaked after Roe in 1980 and has been declining ever since. These are things directly related to the sexual revolution, which made conception easier to obtain and destigmatized its use. It used to be that good girls couldn't co have condoms or pills because it would mean they were sluts who planned on having sex. Now you're hard pressed to find people who are arguing publicly against birth control. Just say real quick, statistics show that teens are having more sex, uh, le are having less sex than before. Only 40% of teens have had sex, way down since the 90s. Millennials are actually, despite all the hand wringing about hookup culture, less promiscuous than boomers or Gen Xers. They have less sexual partners. 
Um, panicky proclamations about how everything is different and bad today get a lot of attention. And no doubt, young people today have different issues to contend with than boomers or Gen Xers or even my generation, the millennials did. But they, you, are also coming of age in a time when there was so much more openness about sex, so much more tolerance, so much more support in reporting and rejecting bad experiences, so many more resources for enabling good experiences, so much more freedom and accountability. We can thank the sexual revolution for both of those things. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker, Louise Perry, please. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you, Providence, for hosting me. I flew in from London. Um, I don't even know when. I have no idea what time of day it is. So <laughs> forgive me for any <laughs> lapses in memory and so on. And forgive me also if I'm not familiar with American statistics. Obviously, being a Brit, um, those, will the, those will be the numbers that come first to mind. But we'll see how we go. So I want to start, um, predictably enough, by quibbling with Elizabeth's definition of the sexual revolution. <clears throat> I think that there are two components to the sexual revolution. The first is a material component. So this is, crucially, the invention of the contraceptive pill in the 1960s, um, initially made available only to married women, and then some years later to unmarried women as well. Um, I don't think that we... I don't think we've really reckoned with the pill. I don't think we've really come to terms with quite how radical it is. It was never possible in the whole history of our species for women to control their reproduction in the way that the pill first permitted them to, in terms of it being invisible, it being controlled by women, etc. And, of course, since then we've had many more technological um, elaborations on the pill, including long-acting reversible contraceptions, which, by the way, are the cause of the drop in teen pregnancy and so on that Elizabeth cited at the end of her talk just then. So that's the first thing. The materi our material circumstances change enormously. This happens at the same time as um, a shift from an industrialized economy to a service-based economy. Um, which allows women to participate more easily. Um, the popularization of things like washing machines and tampons and all these incredibly sort of prosaic things which actually make it much easier for women to participate in work outside of the home. All of these enormous material changes are largely responsible for the changes in sexual politics that we've seen in the last two generations. There is also, though, an ideological story and I think that although I would agree with some of the um, definitions offered by Elizabeth earlier, I think that to be more precise, what we're talking about when we talk about the, the ideological shift of the sexual revolution, which also goes along with so many other ideological shifts that come out of the 1960s in the West, is actually dechristianization. I think actually that is the most precise way of describing what we've seen. So that, and it's, on, and it's an ongoing process, and to some extent what we are the, the point that we're at right now, um, I'm not the first to describe the ideological moment that we're experiencing right now as being something like a second reformation, except that the first reformation obviously was the rejection of Catholicism, whereas now it's the rejection of the whole, of, you know, the whole bundle, it's the rejection of Christianity per se. And it is a, a long ongoing process which will probably last all of our lifetimes. Um, and it has generally been slower in America because America's always been a more religious country because we exported all our religious extremists here. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> that process of dechristianization is a very mixed bag, right? I think that Elizabeth and I both agree that the past, the pre-sexual revolution past was a long way from being blissful and idyllic. I would, I would never claim that it was. I think that any enormous historical event always has its trade-offs. It always has its light and shade. And I describe myself as a, as a progress apostate in the sense that there are some, you know, components of what is often described as progressivism that I agree with. But what I don't agree with is the account of history offered by the ideology, ideology I'm calling progressivism. That is the idea that history has a shape that things get better, that we're on some kind of linear, upward, you know, drift towards improvement. Um, the arc of the moral universe bending towards justice, the famous Martin Luther King Jr. term, which was um, Obama had embroidered into the carpet in the Oval Office. It is, you know, the guiding, the guiding principle, I think, of our era. And I think it's wrong. I don't think that history has a shape. I don't think that things are have got better or will inevitably get better. I think it's a mixed bag. And I think that the um, material changes um, have good effects and they have bad effects. And the pill is a really, really good example of that. It's had both. Um, 
to go back to this issue of dechristianization, so the, my, I start from the premise, quite a controversial premise, that men and women are profoundly different from one another. Um, obviously on a physical level, I say obviously. Ob it, it ought to be obvious on a physical level, so women are the half of the human species who can get pregnant, men are the half who can do the impregnating. Um, women are a lot smaller and weaker than men, so uh, I, I can't remember the statistics, off my, off, the statistics off the top of my head, but I think that men can bench press double what women can bench press routinely and that can punch with the same kind of force. Um, basically, all men are stronger than basically all women, which has obvious um, social salience when it comes to men and women being alone together. Basically, um, almost all men can kill almost all women with their bare hands, but not vice versa. And um, you know, I contend that that matters profoundly. There are also psychological differences between the sexes. Um, they're average ones, and this is something that even really clever people can struggle, struggle to get their heads around. One component in particular, which is most relevant to our discussion today, is a trait called sociosexuality, um, which is the term psychologists use to describe your interest in sexual variety. So not exactly your sex drive. One could be have a high sex drive, but be, have, have restricted sociosexuality and vice versa. But it is um, a component of your personality. It's fairly consistent across your lifetime. And it differs between men and women on average. So you can imagine two bell curves, overlapping bell curves, male and female. There are lots of outliers. There's lots of overlap in the middle. But I don't think anyone who's got any experience of the world will be surprised to hear this. Men are on average higher in sociosexuality than are women. Men are on average more interested in sexual variety than are women. So that means men are going to be, in general, more interested in things like watching porn, more interested in um, having hookups, more interested in buying sex. It's, some, it's a gap, I call it the sociosexuality gap, it's a gap that we see across time and place. I am not aware of any culture on the anthropological record where it's been women who've been going out, buying sex and, you know, craving hookups. This is a very, very consistent pattern that we see uh, in the human species. And it's one that makes perfect sense given our distinct reproductive roles. Getting reproduction is much costlier for women than it is for men when you get pregnant. I, I mean, having sex is probably one of the most consequential things a woman can do. Because if you get pregnant, you're looking at in the pre-abortion universe, right? Bearing in mind, it's not just the legalization of abortion that you see in the 1960s, it's also the fact that it's made safe. It's just difficult in most times and places to have truly safe sort of modern medical abortions that we have now. So what you're talking about is the risk of nine months of very arduous pregnancy, dangerous childbirth, many, many years of infant care and childcare, or a dangerous attempt at an abortion or infanticide. Those are basically your options, or adoption potentially. Those are some tough options, right? It, it makes sense that women would be the sex who are more choosy about who they want to have sex with. Whereas in theory, men can ride off into the sunset and impregnate many more women, you know? Like, in theory, a man can reproduce every time he orgasms. It is therefore completely intuitive that you would see these differences between men and women. Average ones, I, I completely agree with Elizabeth that there are some women who I think relish the opportunities offered by sexual liberation, um, relish the opportunity to have sex like a man. That's the phrase that's used in the first ever episode of Sex in the City, um, a show which normalized probably more than any other cultural product, the um, uh, women imitating a masculine style of sexuality. And what I think we've seen post-1960s, is that these, these, these two bell curves, they, they present a problem for every society. How are you going to bridge the sociosexuality gap? Because you have, to put it bluntly, a lot more really horny men than you do really horny women who want to have lots of casual sex with lots of different partners. And if you don't have women who are willing to meet that demand willingly, then the solution that most societies come up with, or many societies, is prostitution. So, so coercing through various means, normally eco economic, um, a subclass of women to meet that demand. That's one option. Or what we've seen post-sexual revolution has been a, uh, a nudging of women up towards the male standard 
a valorization through, for instance, Sex and the City, and through also just the incentive structures of the heterosexual dating market, through which women are encouraged to imitate a more masculine style of sexuality. So encouraged to have more hookups, to say that they're okay with porn, to, to reject all of the bourgeois sexual morality that Elizabeth's already spoken about. What I think we've seen essentially is a reversal of the first sexual revolution, which was the sexual revolution of the first century AD. Now for some historical context, when Christianity came into the Roman world, I don't think that any of us would almost recognize the sexual ethics of the Roman world because our sexual ethics still, despite de-Christianization, is so intensely formed by Christian morality. But the Roman world had absolutely no problem with prostitution provided by legions of slaves. You know, it's estimated at the height of the Roman Empire about a quarter of um, people in Italy were slaves. Um, it had absolutely no problem with Harvey Weinstein, right? Harvey Weinstein in the Roman world would have had completely unquestioned sexual access to his social inferiors. The idea of Me Too would have been unthinkable, right? It is into this world that Christianity comes with some very explosive <laughs> ideas about sexual ethics, not much else, which include the idea that <clears throat> every society, pretty much, including ours, has a sexual double standard to some degree. So has the idea that it's okay for men to be promiscuous, but it's not okay for women to be promiscuous. And the Roman world was no exception. So men, particularly high status men, could do what they wanted pretty much, um, particularly to slaves. And uh, whereas, whereas uh, citizen women were expected to protect their chastity. What Christianity said, what Paul said specifically, was that actually men ought to also restrain themselves, that men also ought to um, not have sex before marriage, to not buy sex, to not sexually exploit their social inferiors. These were enormously radical ideas at the time. And yes, they came with enormous trade-offs. I'm not, not gonna deny them. We've spoken about some of them already. But the thing that I am skeptical about is our ability to construct afresh, for the first time in the history of the world, an entirely new kind of sexual culture which doesn't have any of the trade-offs that Elizabeth and I both lament. I think it is much more likely that actually we have a limited number of options to choose from. There are only so many ways of arranging an enormously uh, complex civilization like ours. And that by lifting the Christian idea of sexual ethics from the culture, we are more likely actually to revert to something more Roman than we are to come up with entirely new and somewhat utopian model of sort of enlightened sexual morality. And that's some of what I describe in my book. So I talk about um, the, the porn industry, hookup culture. Um, I do agree with Elizabeth actually that you, you see this strange um, paradox happening among the young people raised on porn, which is that on the one hand, we have an enormously sexualized public life. Click of the button, you have access to absolutely anything you can imagine, a lot of things you can't imagine in terms of sort of um, human sexuality. Um, we have a lot more uh, sex on TV, and on, you know, on the streetscape, etc. But on the other hand, people are actually having less sex. Um, the so-called sex recession, which has now gone on long enough, it's probably actually a sex depression. Um, record numbers of um, men in particular um, not having sex into their 20s, um, Gen Z just not going on dates apparently, you know, all this kind of grim statistics. Um, I actually don't think that those things are necessarily um, a, in contradiction with one another. I think actually they're the same phenomenon. Um, I describe it in the book as cultural death grip syndrome. Um, if you've heard of death grip syndrome, it's basically a quasi-medical term for when you um, masturbate so much that you become impotent. I think in a sense that's what we're seeing in our culture as well. Because as well as lifting the um, flawed, but also in some senses um, stable Christian sexual ethical system, we've also introduced all of the, um, the joys and terrors of modern technology, particularly the internet. And uh, I don't quite have time, I think I'm running out of time to talk about, um, maybe this is something we'll get onto. Um, 
But I think that the internet in particular has the ability to turbocharge some of the most frightening and exploitative aspects of human sexuality, which is often very dark. That is that is the nature of human sexuality. It has, um, in both men and women, there is a dark side. And um, the term I borrow in my book is um, freedom for the pike is death for the minnow. It may seem as though by um, lifting the old system of, of uh, the regulation of heterosexuality, you are um, inviting greater freedom and happiness into everybody's lives. But the risk is actually that by um, freeing everyone within the system, you end up freeing the exploiters, the Harvey Weinsteins, um, to the great cost of the minnows. I'll end it there. Thank you very much. I will uh, reset the clock here and also invite uh, everyone to start thinking about the questions you might have. And, and I do believe that the, the, the box, the form is open, so feel free to start sending in those questions. Uh, the second round, we'll, each person will have an opportunity to uh, offer clarifications and, and rebuttals to what they heard in the first round. And so we will, of course, start with uh, Elizabeth Nolan Brown. Thanks. Um, not quite sure. Uh, just going to sort of respond in a little bit of a disjointed way to just just a couple of points there. Um, you know, there there's a lot of at the end. You know, we were talking about what is causing teenagers and young adults today to have less sex. And there's a lot of speculation about this. And it, first of all, I think it's a little weird that, that people are so worried about it because for so many years, especially throughout like my young adulthood, especially throughout like the 90s and the early 2000s, like everyone was freaking out about how much sex people were having. And then suddenly it was like, hey, the kids are actually having less sex, sex. They're having less sexual partners. And everyone was like, oh my God, this is bad too. So I, I, you know, it's, it's kind of a very strange phenomenon we find ourselves in. Um, there's not actually evidence for, strong evidence for any particular reason why this is the case. So that has left room for everyone to sort of project their own favorite explanations on it. Either it's, you know, it's because of porn or it's because of social media or it's because of cell phones or everything. Um, and, you know, I think that in, in, in some individual cases, there might be some truth to, to all of these things, but we don't really have any particular evidence showing that. And there is some evidence countering that. There was actually a study um, recently at Rutgers University that, that surveyed a lot of young people and about why, you know, what was linked to having more or less sex. Um, and they found that the number one predictor for men and women of having less sex was that there was less alcohol, less casual sex, was that there was less alcohol consumption amongst these 18 to 25 year olds. So that's actually a very positive thing. You know, that implies that people are, are you know, having less drunken sex that they might regret or that might be dangerous. Um, the study also found for men, but for young men, but not women, um, it was associated with video games, playing more hours of video games. So there is that. That is one per, you know, potential uh, negative technology thing. And also just people living at home more. More people are living at home with their parents. So we can look at you know, these things that aren't necessarily these ideological or cultural reasons, but maybe just economic reasons because it's harder for younger people to be going out on their own, affording houses, affording the price of college, and so they wind up living at home. And that sort of you know, impedes your opportunity to have sex. So I, I don't think we can necessarily say that there's you know, all of these bad reasons why people are having sex and that this, having less sex and that it's necessarily uh, a bad thing. Um, one thing I was gonna say before too is just that I, I found it interesting that when you, you know, we, for, for decades now too, I've heard people uh, complaining about millennials and now Gen Z and, and the hookup culture and things like that. But it's actually a lot less prevalent than, than people might have you believe too. Um, I mean, I, I know maybe it feels like it when you are on college campuses or when you are in your 20s and, and dating and it feels like everyone is just having casual sex. But I think that's because those are the things we necessarily hear about, um, especially in the media, but you know, also maybe from your friends, or maybe you know, you don't you don't hear people be like, "Oh, I, I didn't have sex last night." You know, that's not something people talk about. Um, but the, you know, there was there was a study saying that something like um, 
thirty-five percent of of people that were on college campuses said they were they abstained from having casual sex. I mean, not that they abstained entirely from sex, but that they were not having casual sex at all. Um, Twenty-five percent of the people said that they were and they loved it, and uh, the other group, which was about a third of the people, said that they sometimes partook in in hookup culture, and that. It was they were they were ambivalent about it. Sometimes it was good, sometimes it was bad. They had good and bad experiences. So I, I think this idea that it's that it's impossible, you know, to opt out. There's just a lot of research showing that that is actually not the case. Plenty of people are opting out. It is it is not meaning that they are not able to ever find anyone who likes them. There are there are people out there um, at on all sorts of different you know levels of comfortableness with with casual sex. And I think that's a good thing. It, it allows people to to do what is making them comfortable. What, whether that is, you know, having a lot of casual sex, having no sex whatsoever, having sex with a committed relationships, there, there's room for all of that. Um, I, I, in terms of social sexuality, I'm, I'm, I think it's really interesting, but I'm not sure how relevant that is because I don't think the sexual revolution means that women have to have sex with lots of people or that they have to have sex with anyone. Um, I'd argue that, in fact, it's made us take more seriously a belief in women saying no. I mean, there used to be this idea that that you know, women who were saying no to sex or to to any sort of sexual activity were just like playing coy because that was what the sexual script required. You know, they had to protest first, but their no really meant yes. They just wanted the men to convince them. And I think we've really come away from that idea, and that's you know, that's a good thing. We are actually taking ser more seriously the idea that that women can say no and actually mean it. That it's not just a, a provocation to try and get people to try and convince them a little bit more. Um, and I think that's one of the many ways that we are doing something new. Um, we said, said, you know, that we are we are in uncharted territory, and I think that that's true, or, or at least you know we've we've been in uncharted territory for the past fifty years or so, and we we but we have been formulating new rules. We haven't just gone back to to this uh, Roman values on, on sexuality or things like that, you know? We have definitely gotten, as, as I said earlier, we've gotten more permissive about some things, but we've also gotten more restrictive about some things. And I, I think arguably a lot of those things are very, very good, you know? We've, we've developed much more, um, well, like I just mentioned, we've developed much more belief in people saying no, meaning no. We've developed much more, um, you know, condemnation of people who are abusing their power to to sort of prey on people in the workplace or who might they might have some sort of power over. We've gotten much less tolerant of people sexualizing teenagers or, or young people and, you know, um, sort of, you know, like even in the 90s, I mean, you had like the, the Britney Spears phenomenon, you had just like so much of this like grown men sort of uh, talking constantly about these these like 14, 15, 16 year old girls and I think that there's much more condemnation of that. So it, it isn't true that we have necessarily just, you know, the sexual revolution has just necessarily meant that we've gotten totally liberal or that we've just let men sort of, you know, um, run amok and, and just sort of, you know, because they're more so, have more social sexuality that we've just sort of let them make the rules. I think that we really are forging a, a new situation and it's far from figured out. Maybe it's, you know, never going to be figured out. Um, but I think that we have, have made admirable strides and we should, you know, keep making those strides in trying to figure out what what good sex looks like for for people of all genders. And, you know, what what and when I say good sex, I obviously mean, you know, both physically and in terms of making people feel good about themselves and good about their partners. And I think that we are the sexual revolution has really been actually helping bring clarity on that as opposed to the opposite. Thank you. I'll reset the timer here. Ms. Perry. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. So this question of uh, sort of so what about um, sociosexuality, a really interesting fact, which um, is uh, you know relevant given where we're speaking today, is that the proportion of um, men and women on a university campus seems to have a measurable effect on the sexual culture on that campus um, because uh, universities are a relatively closed environment um, with lots of young people who, no offence, have basically nothing to do all day. Um, people have a lot of sex, right? That hookup culture thrives. And 
when there are more men than women on a campus, um, women are the sort of the rarer, more valuable um, commodity. I know it's horrible to talk in these economic terms, but this is how it works. Um, sexual cultures tend to be more monogamous, less casual, basically conform more to female preferences. Whereas when you have um, uh, fewer men, more women, which increasingly is the case in all um, universities now because you have more and more women studying, uh, the opposite happens and you have more of, a, more of a hookup culture because men are able to set the terms of the culture more effectively than women can, which I think shows us the fact that uh, the sort of... Um, I would say it's like a naive view of choice is um, the idea that now that we've sort of lifted all the old restrictions, people can just make up their own minds, doesn't actually quite work in practice because the nature of sex, the nature of most things, but the nature of sex in particular is that it's networked. You have sex with other people, they have sex with other people. You know, even if you are not personally watching porn, for instance, you're likely to um, be having sexual relationships with people who have or people who have had sexual relationships with people who have, etc. It ends up sort of suffusing the culture whether or not you want it to. I mean, just one example of this. Um, a couple of dec decades ago, um, choking during sex, or more accurately described as strangulation, uh, is basically unheard of. Is in a niche within a niche, right? Now it's on the front page of Pornhub, and uh, you know, according to survey data, data I've seen, about half of women aged 18 to 25 in the UK report being choked by their partners sometimes consensually, sometimes not consensually. The point is it's become extremely normal in a way that, according to older women I've spoken to, it absolutely was not until relatively recently. I don't think that everyone all woke up on the same day and decided that choking was suddenly the flavor of the month, right? It's to do with the way that these, these things are networked, the, pay, the way that people respond to incentives. You know, if you're a young woman on a university campus and you would much prefer to have a monogamous relationship, you would much prefer to you know, wait for several months or something into a relationship before having sex, you have fewer options now than you used to. I completely uh, can see Elizabeth's point that there have always been cases of that, of that not working. You know, the default used to be that you went on a date and um, you would not be having sex at the end of that date. That was the expectation. Now, and of course there were cases where, of course there were cases where, where women were raped when, when women you know, change their minds or whatever. Of course, they were, they were outliers, but the default expectation was that. Now the default expectation is that you will be having sex. And the position that puts women in, that, which is largely to do with the pill, is largely to do with the fact that there are, there are no consequences now. I mean, in reality, there are actually a lot of unintended pregnancies still from casual sex, but women, you know, can, can now uh, privately and, and legally do deal with the consequences in, in a way that men don't have to trouble themselves with. Uh, Legalised abortion is enormously in men's interests, but that's another conversation. In fact, your next disputation. <laughs> um, now the expectation is that you will be having sex, and that means that women are in the position where they are having to be on the defensive in that negotiation. Yes, there will be some women who, who really want to have casual sex, who really enjoy casual sex. I mean, the figures on the proportion of women who orgasm during casual sex are not pretty, I'll tell you. Like, women are not actually getting a great deal out of this. And as I mentioned at the very top, um, the enormous physical differences between men and women mean that women are always at a disadvantage whenever they're alone with a strange man. You know, casual sex carries enormous risks for women in a way that it doesn't for men without very many benefits, which is why my argument is that actually um, the, winner, the real winners of the sexual revolution have been the minority of men. It is a minority who now have access to um, sexual liberation for them personally, but it is at, at a cost borne by other people, primarily women. Um, which is why, I mean, I, 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 my task is to defend, obviously, a fairly sort of um, blunt statement about this, this history. As I've tried to lay out, I think it is somewhat more complex than that. Um, but what I certainly reject, and which I hope you reject too, having listened to all of this, is this simplistic narrative of progress, the idea that things, the, that the arc of the universe is bending towards anything, particularly when it comes to sexual culture. Thank you.
Uh, we will now start the question and answer period. Um, hopefully you've been sending, I see that you've sent in a number of questions already. Please continue to do so. Uh, so we will continue until quarter after. So just so you know, we, won't, we will not go over. And the first question is, is for both of these presenters. What aspects of the opposing arguments that you've heard today do you find most persuasive? What's, what's most challenging to you to your own view and what the other person said, and how do you think about uh, those challenges? I will start with you if that's okay, Elizabeth. Yeah, um, I, I don't know that I'd say this necessarily challenges my own view, but I, I completely agree with Louise that I don't think that we're, you know, I don't, I don't believe in, in inevitable progress. I don't think, like she has said several times, that you know that the the arc of the universe is, is bending towards progress. Um, I think you know, that we have made progress in, in not just, you know, interpersonal relations, but in many things. And also we have gone back in some things. And I think that it does require, you know, I, I don't believe this idea that we need to just, it'll get better. Things will get better if we just let them be, right? I do think that these, it's important that we're having conversations about this sort of stuff. Um, just because I think that the sector revolution has, has necessarily been good so far, it doesn't mean that, you know, it would it will always be good just because of that and, and that it hasn't come with any trade-offs. I certainly accept that there have been, have been trade-offs and that we also need to, to guard against, um, you know, Back, backsliding in, in certain things that were, were desirable about previous sexual cultures. Louise. Um, just a quick note, I wouldn't, use, I wouldn't even use terms like forward and backsliding. Even to do that is to sort of concede the progress model of history. But anyway, maybe we can get into that. Um, uh, Elizabeth makes some very strong points about um, the wrongs done to women in the past, like the relatively recent past, say the 1950s. Um, the nature of uh, studying the history of sexuality is that it's a private thing and people didn't really keep like data on it <laughs> in any way up until recently, which means that you're, you're inevitably sort of dealing um, with um, lots of anecdotes often and um, having, say, reliable um, data on sexual violence is really difficult. So I, I concede Elizabeth's point that um, there uh, there is certainly some doubt when it comes to um, assessing the direction of travel when it comes to things like rape over the last half century. Thank you. This question is for Ms. Perry. Uh, you spoke mostly about women and men having sex but I am interested in your opinion that the sexual revolution has made life worse off when the sexual revolution has allowed women to step into men's roles and become equal. This has allowed you to even speak before us. So do you see a discrepancy there or tension there? Yeah, so we didn't really talk very much about work, um, which is obviously another facet of sexual revolution. We sort of talked um, exclusively about sexuality. Uh, it is some, the subject of my next book, conveniently enough. Um, yes, I mean, what has happened essentially is that women have been permitted access to traditionally masculine spheres, um, particularly professionally. Um, I mean, working class women have always worked, but middle class women um, suddenly sort of um, flooded into the workforce, including me. Um, that has come with trade-offs. I mean, one of the, the, the things that we've seen is there hasn't been a, um, a counterpart flood of men into feminine spheres. You know, men have not been clamoring to do the washing up and the childcare, um, which means essentially that no one is really doing the washing up of the childcare, or rather it ends up being outsourced normally to poorer women. Um, so you end up with this rather uh, unstable and often unhappy sort of Ponzi scheme, um, which has its own costs, um, not least the fact that so many women are just foregoing having children at all. Um, and I think that motherhood has probably never been less valued than it is right now, culturally. So, um, you know, certainly on a personal level, I'm very glad to be able to um, participate in public life. But uh, I think it's another, another enormous historical event that has had its light and shade. Would you like to respond to any of that, Ms. Brown? 
All right, so here's a question for you. Do you agree that the sexual revolution has allowed women to have sex like men? And if so, would you characterize that as a positive development? I think it's allowed men and women to have sex like individuals. I'm really hesitant to say that you know, that there's such a thing as having sex like men or having sex like women. Because even if there's an average amount of, say, you know, sociosexuality, even if there's certain, you know, differences in, you know, we can argue about where those lines are drawn, but if we can see that there are some differences in, in you know, men and the average sexuality of, of men and women, um, it, you know, Averages are just averages. There are long tails on either side. There is vast variety in terms of what men and women want from sex. And so I think that one of the things it's done is not so, I mean, you, you might turn, say that it's allowed, you know, women to have sex like men, but I think you, it's better put as just saying like, it's allowed more individuality for everybody to pursue their own version of the sexual good, whatever that means to them without applying some sort of sex or gender label to it. Like to say anything on that point? Okay. I'll ask a question. Uh, this is, is presented to both and, and either one of you can jump in. To what extent does a paradigm of individual autonomy and choice privilege male sexuality at the expense of female sexuality? Is, is the phenomenon of individual autonomy and choice privileging male sexuality at the expense of female uh, sexuality? Uh, yes, and I'd add furthermore, although this is probably a whole other debate that um, Elizabeth and I could have, could have that um, the privileging of autonomy in general tends to benefit the people who have the most to gain and the least to lose, you know, the pikes rather than the minnows. Um, I mean, what we've essentially seen is a sort of free marketization of sex. Um, and, uh, and as I've laid out, there are certain ways, the sexual asymmetry means that there are certain ways in which women um, simply have a lot more to lose from being sort of exposed to the market. Um, and I would apply that to all sorts of other you know, I think honestly that um, if you are um, privileged, not just in ter not just economically, although yes, economically, I mean, I think the biggest losers from the sexual revolution have specifically been poor women. Um, but also, if you are uh, intelligent, you know, good at communication, conscientious, have good impulse control, all of the traits, personality traits that are favoured in our um, modern economy, then uh, social guardrails are a real pain. You know, they're annoying. You don't need social guardrails because actually you're completely capable of making decisions that, have been, uh, that are in your best interests and weighing up options and navigating very complex incentive structures. But if you don't have those advantages, and I particularly apply this to if you're young, you know, 16-year-olds might be of the age of consent, but they're often very poor at making <laughs> decisions that are in their best interests, then I think you desperately need social guardrails. And I think to some extent, the, um, it is incumbent on people who, um, who, who may not need them, who fa may find them annoying, to accept their imposition for the sake of everyone else because, you know, that's the nature of societies. Um, Ms. Brown, same question. To what extent does a paradigm of individual autonomy and choice privilege male sexuality at the expense of female sexuality? Uh, so there's there's sort of a, a you know characterization of, of people who privilege autonomy and choice as as being sort of frivolous or flippant about it. Um, you know this idea that like well if women choose something then it's good and it's a, you know we shouldn't examine it. And I I I don't know anybody who actually you know a, any serious thinkers in this sphere who actually um, argue that. But you know I'm sure that there are some, and I'm sure maybe it was that was a more prevalent you know idea in the in the 80s or 90s or something like that. Um, I, so I, I will say that I, you know, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that we can't just look at choices in a vacuum. We should examine, you know, we should take choices seriously. We should take agency of women's agency seriously, but we should also examine why people are making their choices and understand that these happen with all sorts of different life experiences and constraints and things that they bring to them. But I think when we're talking about, you know, whether that's that's been good or bad, I mean, 
the, the question is just, what is the alternative? We don't want people to have a choice in how they conduct their sex lives. We want them to be, what, banned from it? Or we want them to be socially ostracized because of it? I think that, you know, choice is not the be all end all of this conversation, but it is better than any alternatives. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Brown, this question is specifically for you. Uh, do you have concerns that the Overton window has shifted too far or will shift too far with respect to sexuality? What limits should society have, if any? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think that we are constantly, I mean, for for any sort of liberalization of, of sexual mores, there's, there's constantly people pushing back on it. I think where we have shifted the window right now is is pretty good. Um, and I, sorry, what was the second part of the question there? Dang it, I deleted it. Oh, sorry. what limits, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, what limits should society have, if any? I mean, I think, I think, this is going to sound sort of silly, um, but you know, like the harm principle is a pretty good one. We should, we should strive to, you know, not allow practices that that harm others. We should strive for consent as at least a baseline standard, and we should talk about, you know, where we can go above and beyond consent. But but I don't I don't think that we've shifted too far. Ms. Perry. Um. On the harm principle point, at the risk of grossing everyone out in the room, um, Jonathan Haidt, the psychologist, um, who's very interested in politics and um, morality, uses this example among many to try and test people's um, adherence to the harm principle, which is imagine a man goes to the supermarket, buys a dead chicken, takes it home, has sex with it, eats it. Has he done anything wrong? No one knows about this. Um, the chicken is dead, can't be harmed, you know, who is actually being harmed in that scenario? And uh, most liberals who, um, who hold to the harm principle are completely dumbfounded by this question because they find it disgusting and they want to say that he's done something wrong, but they can't work out exactly why. Um, conservatives normally have more ease in answering it because conservatives hold to ideas of, for instance, uh, sacredness and sex is it, sex is um, typically considered sac sacred in most religious traditions. Um, the problem with just holding to the harm principle and just having a sort of um, bare bones um, morality based on consent is that there are an enormous number of things which actually can be commit can be permitted according to the consent model, but which most people find intuitively distressing. You know, we, for instance, can justify. Um, criminalizing paedophilia because we can say, well, children can't consent. There we go. And we draw a line um, somewhere. You know, it has to be somewhat arbitrary, but we draw a line and we say anything under, under this age and, and the child can't consent and that's that. There are an enormous number of things which I could describe as sort of paedophilia adjacent, which um, you can't forbid according to the consent model. You can't forbid uh, drawings of child porn, for instance. You can't forbid adults dressing up as children and having sex. There's a long list of things which give most people the ick, which really um, uh, sort of fire up our moral intuitions, but you can't object to according to the consent model. And I think what that tells us is that the consent model isn't up to the job. It actually can't really either properly protect vulnerable people or properly actually express what the vast majority of people feel to be true. I mean, an overriding point here is that no society has ever come up with a system of sexual ethics which says, have at it, you know, it's a free for all. That has never been a solution that any society has arrived at. And I think that's for very good reason because this is an enormously uh, risky and complex and difficult area of um, human relationships. And unfortunately, even if it might be difficult, we do have to find some way of regulating it through some sort of ethical system. And this question is for you, Ms. Perry. Um, you, this, this questioner says you made many good points with respect to the sexual revolution and its effect on women. Uh, 
But I haven't said as much about the effect on men. Is 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 it been positive for men? Is in in your view? Um, how would you answer that? Um, I think it's been positive for some men. So I, I open my book with um, talk about Hugh Hefner and Marilyn Monroe as the sort of um, iconic figures of the sexual revolution. I think the likes of Hugh Hefner, sort of attractive, extremely unrestricted in sociosexuality, um, they've had a ball. Um, with the proviso that Hefner, by the end of his life, was a fairly pathetic figure, that being the playboy does have a shelf life um, to some degree. But in general, those men have had a good time. Um, there's a much bigger story here, though, actually, about the degree to which dating has become much more unequal among men. It's become much easier for particularly attractive high-status men to attract a lot of casual sex and often treat women really badly um, because they can get away with it. <laughs> And uh, a lot more men who actually can't form sexual relationships at all. So I wouldn't say that those men are winning out. Um, there's also a much bigger story about um, male um, uh, unemployment and the um, increasing uh, difficulties that boys and young men are having in education. And um, I certainly wouldn't say the last 60 years have been unambiguously a good thing for men by any means. Do you like to speak question of the sexual revolution's effect on men? No, I kind of want to go back to the supermarket chicken guy, but, <laughs> but, but I'll refrain. You can do that. <laughs> sure. Um, okay. Uh, so, Ms. Brown, this question is for you. Hypersexualization of women is a large consequence of the sexual revolution. How do you think, if you do, that this has aided women? It clearly helps men in several ways, but what do women gain? I think, I mean, it's, it depends on what you mean by hypersexualization. People, some people will, you know, point to very extreme things. Other people think that, you know, women on, in bikinis on, on magazine covers is, is hypersexualization. Uh, I don't think that we can make sort of blanket statements about how, how this plays out. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of times when people talk about it, they act like it's something that women have necessarily done to the uh, uh, is having done to them and I think a lot of what people think of women's sexuality on display now especially in the social media era is them actually taking more control over their own sexualization and say you know I'm taking control of my image I'm taking control of the way I portray my sexuality to the world um, I think we have more of that than ever before and that's an undeniably a good thing I also think that it's sort of naive to say that there was some era where women, um, you know, weren't being sexualized uh, or objectified in, in this way. I think we've made great strides on, on moving away from this thing where only, um, you know, men or rich corporations were profiting off of women's images. And that was always happening. It may have been less explicit um, in terms of, you know, the amount of skin being shown or something like that. But it was almost worse in terms of the the implications, you know, like you see like old Hollywood uh, things from the, from the 1920s and 1930s. And I mean, these these women were just portrayed as, as dumb as box of rocks and just, you know, purely out there for their looks. So, I mean, that was sort of a, a form of hypersexualization or hyper objectification, too. Um, I think that, you know, I don't think it's necessarily worse now than it has ever been by any means. And I think that we, for, you know, for every bad example, we can just point to examples of, of women taking control and exerting their own sexuality. And, and that's a good thing. Thing on the hypersexualization of women and good. All right, we will now move toward the determination. First of all, would you help me to thank both of our speakers today for their <laughs>